Uh, I'm so glad that you're here with us today for this New York City Cognitive Behavioral Association webinar on the very timely topic, COVID-19 and uncertainty, can we still do exposure response prevention for OCD? I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Jonathan Grayson, a worldwide expert on the treatment of OCD and a personal mentor to guide us in these murky times. Dr. Grayson has been treating OCD for over 40 years and has written, lectured, and taught about OCD for as long. He has been awarded the International OCD Foundation Patty Perkins Lifetime Achievement Award, and his excellent book, Freedom from OCD, has received the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy Self-Help Book Merit Award. Dr. Grayson has been featured in the national media, including People Magazine, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Nightline. He co-founded the first OCD goal support group and has been offering it bi-weekly free of charge for the past 39 years. His annual camping trip has become legendary in the OCD community. I first met Dr. Grayson 15 years ago as an extern at the Anxiety and Agoraphobia Treatment Center in Balakinwood, Pennsylvania. John taught me how to do therapy. He gave so many of us that gift. His creativity, empathy, passion, and irreverence were and continue to be inspiring. So after working with him, I saw my future more clearly. Seven years ago, I started my own goal support group here in New York City. John does things because they are right and because they are fun and does not get bogged down by much else. When our world started to come crashing down in March, he was one of the people I looked to to consider the question on so many of our minds. How do we still do our important work during this time? Just before I turn this over to Dr. Grayson, I will mention that you can submit questions over the chat function to the panelists, and we will get to as many of them as possible. So without further ado, Dr. Jonathan Grayson. Good morning. It's really weird to be speaking where I can't really see the audience. So I feel like I'm talking to myself, but I am a little nuts, so it's okay. And I, I did want to start out on, on you know, some of the things that I'm expecting to uh, get from coronavirus and this tragedy we're happening. Uh, since 1977, I have been missing my ponytail. And uh, now that we're housebound and I can't get my hair cut, I, I think there's a good shot I will have a ponytail back. Uh, I'm also very interested in memes. You know, when a meme comes up, you always wonder where did it start? And because, uh, you know, often the person even who popularizes the meme is not really the person who started it. So I'm going to cut you in on a secret where you're going to get to know where a meme started if it takes off. And although I don't expect to get any credit for it, you all will know. So the meme is going to be known as the Pan Tan, short for Pandemic Tan. And this is how everybody will look in July because half their face is covered with a mask and they take the mask off and they have that white bottom part of the face and the dark top part, pan tan. Feel free to spread it because that's the only way we're gonna actually have it become a meme. So we're living in really strange times. And, and before talking about what we can do, I wanna talk about what we've done in the past with OCD because obviously a lot of the things we did we're in you know, technical violation of medical recommendations. So for the past 40 years, I've been putting my hands in dumpsters, dumpsters three or four times a week, putting my hands in my mouth, rubbing toilets, putting my hands in my mouth. All these things that technically are dangerous. Um, and the reason we chose to do that is you know, it seems that although it was possible to get sick, it was clear that the odds were low. Uh, and, and the reason we know the odds were low is that me and all my colleagues, you know, people special like Anna, you know, we didn't get sick. We didn't lose a ton of patients. So then we come to this situation where suddenly we're doing a lot of things that, um, you know, seemingly we wouldn't do before. And, you know, there are questions about it. Uh, I was reading a, from an epidemi epidemiologist pandemic specialist the other day. And, you know, he said, he's not sure that hand washing is important. I mean, he says, medically, he's a health person, you know, as a health official, loves hand washing for germs and everything and really recommends it. But he doesn't know whether it's, that, that's really important here because it's a respiratory, you know, mainly spreading a respiratory problem. 
However, the problem is they, we don't know. And, and I think one of the scariest things to people in the OCD community is hearing that after 40 years, I am washing my hands, which I find exceedingly painful. So we're kind of trying to follow the CDD, CDC recommendation. And I just want to say, as I'm, I'm talking, uh, I mainly would like to be asking questions, answering questions. I'd like to ask them too, but I'm stuck answering them, so I can't. Um, so please be shooting any questions you have, patient questions, something specific, because I will be answering as going along. So here we are in this situation, and the question is, how far do we go just personally in what we do? And what we've been telling patients and ourselves is we're going to try to follow the CDC recommendations. Now, when I say that, you know, there are two caveats to that, um, which is the CDC doesn't go as far as a lot of local health officials or, you know, where health experts on TV will go. So if you watch uh, CNN, because they seem to stick pretty much to the CDC, the CDC will say things like, you know, we want you to wash your hands frequently, but we want you to wash your hands, but all the things they think you don't need to do. So I guess in what I'm saying is we're following them, even though we expect that there might be uh, things that don't make sense. So for instance, they think with regard to washing vegetables, they're saying just cold water. Now I hear that and I'm thinking, wait, wait, I have to wash my hands with soapy water, but but then with this, I, I suddenly can use just cold water. That doesn't make sense. And rationally or irrationally, I've decided we're gonna follow the CDC recommendations. Why? Because if I start to try to use logic and to what seems logical, I will become OCD. You know, so we're telling people, no, don't do, you know, just follow what they're saying and don't do more. Um, which suddenly allows us in a very general way to do a lot of exposure. You know, because a lot of people are saying, well, they say to wash my hands frequently, so I'm doing it all the time in the house. And the thing is, once you've come home and you've done your obligatory 20 second hand wash, there's no reason to wash your hands at home anymore. So from that general thing, we can do a lot of exposure, right? Because once they're in the house, we get to do all the things that we would normally do for exposure. There's no need for them to wash their hands a second time at home. So contamination-wise, that leaves us open to many things. Um, so we're going to be following those, not more, not less. And I could go on. I'm just wondering if there are any questions, but I'm not seeing any. Okay. So... So contamination, the, the other set of questions has to do with food handling. And again, if we just follow the CDC, you know, they, they're, and again, they're kind of dicey in this. They're, well, we don't really think you have to worry about getting it from food. So they're not really recommending, you know, outside of washing vegetables, major cleaning of food or boxes. They're not saying decontaminate all your food, you know. Um, they have, you know, now some people will, wash all their boxes off. Some people, uh, and I admit I do this one and it's so painful. I have patients doing better than me, you know, which is, you know, I stick my non-perishables in a corner for three days because that will magically fix it. Um, but again, I'm just looking, okay. Um, somebody said, well, I have clients disinfect their home once and um, we would not have them disinfect their home once because if their home is that infected, uh, I don't think they're going to be, you know, I, I think if the home is so infected that I need to disinfect it, it's probably too late. Uh, there has not been a general report from the CDC that you need to entirely disinfect your home. Again, it's kind of different if I was working at home or I'm working at an office. In an office where I'm around all these other people, and of course, I don't know anybody who's working, you know, except in hospital, I don't, most people aren't doing that. In an office, okay, people are touching my stuff. I could disinfect my desk. I actually were telling my clients not to disinfect desks. I was saying, you know, basically the main thing in the office is you're trying not to touch your face because maybe that will get it. Fine, wash your hands before you eat in the office. 
but outside of that, there would not be a need to keep disinfecting. The only reason to wash their hands in an office a little bit more often would be maybe they're going to touch their face, so they're going to, you know, because people are unconscious. But that's in an office environment where maybe it's floating around. And of course, what we really know, the most dangerous thing in the office, the thing that people should really avoid doing if they're in an office environment is breathing. So, you know, we would recommend they go to the office and don't breathe. So disinfecting the home is the same question, which uh, there wouldn't be much point to it. You know, some people have said, um, you know, should I socially distance from my uh, family because I don't want to give them COVID-19? And the answer is no, because social distance is not going to do anything for them. They're all breathing your air and you're in an enclosed place. So it doesn't really, you know, if you actually have it and don't know it, then they're likely to get it if you're not actually socially isolating. Um, sorry, I saw a funny question on the side. Uh, somebody's asking about, is this different than any other uncertainty? And no, uh, for those of uh, me and my colleagues, what I have found is my OCD clients who have coped with OCD are doing better than their families and friends. Uh, and, and, and I've gotten letters from old, you know, clients I've seen years ago who were saying how much better they're doing because they learned how to cope with uncertainty. I was saying to Anna earlier, you know, we always, I always tell clients that when you recover from OCD, you will not be normal. You will be better than normal because the average person doesn't really cope with uncertainty that well. I mean, better than you are currently, if I'm talking to you, but they don't do that well. They use a lot of denial. Now with OCD, denial doesn't work. So you're either in heaven or hell. And uh, certainly coming into us, they're in hell because they can't really avoid. And afterwards, you're going to be able to cope with uncertainty. The average person uses denial. I mean, they, they may get away with it for a long time, but every now and then something might come along and mess that person up. With what's happening now, I've been able to say to clients, this is what normal, supposedly normal people look like. Because people are doing all kinds of things that don't make sense. I was reading in Bloomberg News the other day about how many people are poisoning themselves accidentally by using bleach or disinfectants to wash things. So it is like any other uncertainty, and uh, that's going to kind of guide we tr our treatment. Um, you know, some people say that uh, you know the the this coming is proof that all their obsessions were right. Um, which is kind of an interesting point of view because it's like the fact that this is happening, we would never say this wouldn't happen. But if you think about all the years of life one has lost to OCD um, and, the, and that we didn't know if this would happen and life was going to happen after this. So they could choose to live that OCD lifestyle, but what are they going to keep losing to it? Um, and the thing is that we really have to remind clients because everybody gets focused on, I don't want to catch this. If you listen to the CDC and what flattening the curve means, it means we're not going to prevent people from getting this illness. We're kind of expecting the same number of people to get it. We're just trying to have it not all happen at once. California is pretty high for having COVID-19. Uh, but one thing that's really different for us than you guys, uh, at this point, I don't personally know anyone in California with COVID-19, which I gather if you're in New York, that's like crazy. I don't know anyone personally or even like one or two steps removed who has died from COVID-19, unless I include you guys who are my friends. And then I hear like, you know somebody. So that's different here. But they're expecting that essentially all the things we're doing are not going to work to prevent you from getting COVID-19. That if we do not have a vaccine and do not have a viable treatment, which, right, is at best like 18 months away, they figure this virus continues to spread and continues to be a problem until about 70% of the U.S. population has it. So that's the expectation. 70% of the people are going to get this illness. Now we get a treatment before that, less people will die and will be less serious. So we're not really preventing people from getting it since we are expected for these things to fail, which makes sense, right? Wearing cloth masks might slow down the spread if you have it, but it's not preventing you from getting it if you're wearing a mask. So. 
few questions about how can you trust the CDC? You know. Well, and that's a great question because I think you can't trust the CDC. Um, and the only reason to trust the CDC is it's the closest we have to something that's potentially science. I can make argue, you know, I said, if I read experts, I can find experts who would say, this is a dangerous problem. I mean, for people who say this is just like the flu and everybody's making a big deal of it, I just point to New York. Because nobody, when in our lifetime have we seen hospitals where they're running out of supplies and people are dying left and right. So, okay, not just like the flu, clearly way worse. But, you know, the, again, questions about, is it transmitted the way we think? You know, because just as, because it's on a surface doesn't mean you're gonna get it from that surface. So we know that it lives on cardboard. We're pretty sure it doesn't get transmitted that way because we don't see a ton of disease vectors from the US mail from you know, February to March before we isolate. We don't see this like spread of COVID-19 where we can trace it through the mail. But we don't know. So on one hand, we could say, okay, they're telling us to do too much. And the other hand, they're not telling us to do enough. Right? Again, I can wash vegetables with just water. That seems that, but again, um, it's the closest we have. We know it's dangerous, so okay, I've got to pick some standard. I pick that. I, I have people, you know, because I do have clients who are watching TV too much, and of course, you know, they are showing, you know, it, it's more exciting for them to show death and the really horror stories than it is to say, you know, a lot of people don't get it. And, and again, you wouldn't want to give everybody a false sense of security. Uh, I remember a client called me one day really upset they said i just saw in the news a 20 year old died of covid 19. And my response to her was well i mean i told you that happens i didn't say you're young you're invulnerable we just said the odds are better odds are still odds yeah young people will die from this people are going to die for it but again the, the issue is i'm trusting the cdc so that i don't become ocd and I, you know, it's reasonable to take some precautions. Um, so, okay. so again, you know, in a minimal, and I'm just, if I just stay in contamination, eventually I'll talk about something else. Because then if I don't trust the government, well, there's no one to trust. I tell people when they watch the news too much, because it does make them crazy. We say like, okay, you can watch the news 15 minutes a day, uh, twice a day, and we want you to watch a source that's basically citing the CDC. Even if I use the major channels where they have the local respectable health experts on, those guys will often say things that go way beyond the CDC, you know, which makes people feel crazy. Um, How about going outside? What about the the clients who are not willing to go outside right now, what would you say to them? Because they're afraid of, of the contamination risk. That's, um, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, I have a few things. Uh, one, I would encourage people to take walks. And, and um, the reason being, it seems like currently that, you know, the dispersal from the air of I'm staying six feet away from people lowers the odds I'm going to catch something. So I wouldn't want to be in a crowd. And I say, you know, my wife and I take these, you know, our daily pandemic walk where, you know, we look a little, mild. now it's not too crowded because no one's in the street, but, you know, we see a person approaching 20 feet away. It's like, okay, there's a person walking towards us. And, you know, we get a little, you know, it's like, okay, are they going to move or are we going to move? But um, so we are encouraging people to take walks anyway. On the other hand, going in places, um, uh, I let them, I'll say, use your own judgment in terms of what you're willing to risk. The risk is higher if you go inside. You know, we, we, we know that if you hang around inside, it's worse than they thought. Not deadly, but it's worse than they thought. If I, I mean, certainly if they were at a risk person, it doesn't make, it makes less sense to go go inside to a place currently 
again, this is with the data we currently have. At some point, you know, we have a better understanding of what, how it spreads and doesn't spread, I'll be able to um, start doing all the crazy things that I'm used to doing that I'm missing doing. You know, I, I, a ton of contamination things I can no longer do. Um, you know, so somebody who's, let's say, um, wearing a mask inside the house, there's like no point. You know, if I have COVID-19, well, let's put it this way. Yeah, if I have COVID-19 unknowingly and I'm in my house and I'm worried about my family, my wearing a mask for that long of exposure is not going to protect them. I'm not wearing, an, a, you know, a, a really great mask. And, um, you know, if they're going to get it, they're going to get it. They Washing my hands and not touching anything is not going to protect them because it's mainly respiratory. So they did that. Maybe I have it. So I'm going to do, you know, wear a mask inside the house is useless. Your family will probably get it. You know, and that's the thing. People worry, what if I give it to my family unknowingly? And the answer is that might happen. You know, I mean, yes, you might, you know, let's talk about realistically, how would you cope with that? because it's like any other horrible disaster. It can happen. How will you try to live with it? Because you know, all we know is you didn't do it on purpose. But you know, we do get to say something like, you know, well, wearing a mask probably would not have protected them. So unless you're gonna totally socially isolate from them, uh, which is that possible in your house? And does that make sense? And of course, if you look at the Chris Como, you know, he isolated himself in the basement and his wife still got it. So, you know, maybe you need to move out of the house and we're starting to think that that's probably not reasonable. You know, it's not unlike, you know, when somebody's worried, how do I know I'm not gonna kill my spouse tonight? Which I always point out that, well, you know, since usually that requires going crazy, you're as great at odd of going crazy as I am. So how do I know I'm not gonna slice and dice my wife tonight? How do I protect my wife, you know? I could keep the knife that I have by the bed, not by the bed. It's really in a drawer. But the you know, bottom line is, if I'm going to go crazy and kill her, I can probably go to the kitchen and get it. You know, there's no, the only precaution I can take is not living with her. And so if you don't know that you have COVID-19, um, then you have to live normally. Um, you know, let's see. And I guess along those lines, a lot of our um, participants are asking specific strategies to coping with the uncertainty. Is this a time for more imaginal um, exposures? W what do you recommend specifically? I always like imaginal exposure for coping with uncertainty. You know, when I think of imaginal exposure, uh, I always think of it in like three or four things need to be done. Uh, one, I never say you will get sick or whatever. It's like, this might happen because that's what you're afraid. But then always, well, how would you attempt to cope with it? Because if it actually happens, you actually would have to do something. And um, so there is, uh, how would I actually cope with it? You know, if my spouse suddenly ends up with COVID-19 or I don't know where she got it, I don't know if I gave it to her because we're pretty isolated. Um, I'm living in a condo. Could I get it in the condo? Maybe, you know, if I'm living in a place, you know, I mean, you know, for people who are working with patients, you know, I have a New York client whose uh, spouse is working one of the, uh, actually it's one of the ones in the newspaper, right? Working in an old age home where they don't have adequate protection from the clients and clients have COVID-19. So people in that situation, right? They, they get to do one of two things. Either they're gonna isolate from their family for the, throughout this for months, some people choose that, or they're risking it. Um, it's not like we have an alternative to that. So we're, you know, we're not pretending that um, such things don't actually happen. Um, I, you know, part of it's being realistic. You might give your family it, but you know, what, what are you doing at home to avoid it that makes no sense? Somebody wrote something, and I didn't read the question carefully, but what if I live in a high density environment where there are lots of people around? You know, should I do more hand washing or not? If we're really in a high density environment with a lot of people actually potentially have it, okay. And, if, and we're really talking where you're around people, okay, maybe you'd wash your hands before you ate. 
not that we're sure you can get it that way. Washing your hands frequently if you're in that high density environment is not going to matter. Because if it's a high density environment with uh, whatever, you know, not an amazing ventilation system, that's how you're catching it. We don't have N95 masks, so you have to get it fitted and change it and all these things. You're getting the illness. You know, so it's kind of like part of the exposure is like there's some cold, hard truths. So if I'm living in a, with a lot of people uh, and they're not following the directions or they're at risk for some reason, I don't have a way to prevent getting it. And, and so people like, but that's, that's not right, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, certainly some, you know, so some of the cleaning rituals we're doing, again, we want it to be the minimum. We have to explain to clients, hey, listen, this hand wash you're going to do, this 20 seconds, you're not going to feel clean. You know, so, so in a sense, although not the way I would like it, it's a partial exposure, right? It's like you're doing this 20 seconds and you have to stop, period. Uh, you're going to still feel dirty. That's fine. Um, So, go on. Oh, uh, what do you recommend uh, for ERP with packages and mail delivery? And, and that's like one of the really interesting ones. Because <laughs> again, on one hand, we think it doesn't spread that way. Just because it seems like the spread should be much worse than it is. Of course, you know, since it's not a good testing program, we actually have no idea. So at a maximum, not a minimum, you know, it's like you want to stick the package in a corner for three days, fine. You want to open the package outside and dump the clean contents in your house and then throw away the packaging, fine. And then you do your 20 second hand wash. Um, I, I hate saying these kind of things, but yeah. So, so we would we we would say like, okay, yeah, fine, do that, but that's it, you know. Um, I don't know, you know, when I go out and everything, and I have touched a mailbox to mail the package, and I've uh, then come in, and my keys, I use my keys to get in. Uh, I haven't disinfected my keys. Um, I'm thinking guessing okay that's kind of a low rate i saw the, i saw the other day some there was a spe, somebody spelling a special device to to open doors with a little key thing to touch things i'm thinking why not just use my keys why would i have to buy something I mean, i'm really scared right i mean what's the difference using that and a key but yeah so we're not disinfecting uh no disinfecting or stripping down clothes like we're pretending like clothes are invulnerable. Some people point and say the CDC recently said something about it can be on shoes. However, they said it can be on shoes of people working in like a COVID-19 unit. So then that's the only place to get dicey about clothes. And I'm like, all right, maybe, maybe if you're working on that, you can take your clothes off and put them right in the wash, you know, and do something about the shoes. But we would then get, you know, again, make that, make that, that a very hard line. If you're working in a COVID-19 unit, you go into a food store, nope, you don't get to dis decontaminate your shoes or treat your clothing as, as contaminated. Again, it does not seem to be a serious disease factor. We don't want people showering when they come in the house. Well, but one of the questions that's coming up is, you know, it, there's kind of this assumption that you come in, you wash your hands for the 20 seconds and your house is, um, it's still clean um, or, you know, so once you're in the house, you can do all sorts of exposures right. in the house. But if you are having, if you're living with um, other people who are medical workers, if you're living in close proximity, if you come in um, and, you know, just take off your clothes and don't um, wash them if you're um, walking around with your shoes on, you know, is, can we still say, oh, okay, well, this is still... Wait, who am I? Am I the, am I the worker or am I living with workers? Living with, I think, living with. Oh, see, I can act normal because if they have it, I'm screwed. Okay. Washing my hands isn't going to protect me. Right, washing, taking a shower is not going to protect me. I'm breathing their air. You know, I think the one thing we know 
is sharing the air is going to be the worst. And, and, the, and you know, and, and the thing is, when you're inside, not outside, where there's, you know, pretend, hopefully a lot of air dispersal because the air can go anywhere, air's floating around the room, you know, and the longer I'm in that, you know, in that house, um, the more likely, I mean, you know, look at cruise ships where ventilation sucks and all the rooms share air. Um, you know, it spreads throughout the cruise ship, even when they isolate them. Uh, now, presumably, you live in an apartment building, your air system is technically separate from the other apartments. You live in a house, uh, I mean, they say self-isolate, but your house is, you know, every room is not hermetically sealed from every other room. So if somebody has it, you're basically, you know, exposure is a matter of odds. The more time I spend in that area, the higher my odds. Not definite, right? But the higher my odds. So washing is not going to protect me from those people. Wearing a mask is not going to protect me from those people. Them wearing a mask, you know, maybe that long. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be that protective because right, you're wearing a mask that's, you know, something like um, 70 to 80% effective, but you know, that's a long time to be doing that. So if I'm living with a worker at risk, I am at risk. I you guess a, I guess kind of a follow up to that, and I've seen in the chat, um, people are talking about what about living with a significant other or somebody who is not following the guidelines. Um, you know, we see that as you know, people with OCD, their significant others either collude or we coach them not to um, collude. Um, just people not following the guidelines. How do you yeah. tolerate that? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two answers. One is. I'd like to, you know, if somebody with OCD, I want to know what they consider not following the guidelines. I'm, I'm working with a severe person with on teletherapy uh, who actually has to keep going to work. Uh, now she had to keep going to work and um, the office is pretty empty. Um, and so it's been a challenge for her because she, you know, it's the, first of all, what's been a challenge for me is getting her to not watch the news um, because that, that does throw her over the edge. And she's doing really well, but it's been a challenge, like at work, you know, somebody walked in and they weren't wearing a mask. Can I wash my hands? No. You know, can I wash my stuff? No. Just bottom line is, if they breathed on your phone or touched your phone, like again, the, your bigger danger is that they're there. You can wash your hands when you get home for 20 seconds. You can wash your hands if you're gonna eat lunch at the office, uh, which of course she chooses not to do. We haven't made an exposure eat lunch at the office. So that would be like one modification. Her spouse, he's actually great. Um, and he, 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 he's got the exposure thing down pretty well. You know, so pretty much we're going, whatever he does goes. Uh, and sometimes she'll slip into her old contamination things. So like he didn't do this, like they asked, got nothing to do with the virus. So, I want to know first, what is that person who's violating the rules? I'd really want to know what violating the rules looks like. But let's say there's no question it's a roommate or, you know, spouse who literally doesn't follow the rules, uh, doesn't follow the rules. That would mean like, I don't know, can they find a bar that they're going to or they're getting together with a bunch of friends on the street? It's you know, kind of like you see, you know, like, right, I mean, they'd have to be doing something where they're getting pretty socially connected. So I want to know what not following the rules is, but those people exist. You know, I do have some clients where they have a roommate and it's like, yeah, like I know that, you know, he or she is going out and they're like partying in a room with a bunch of friends and I have no idea what any of them are doing. Well, it's reality. You're screwed. You know, there's not like this, you know, it's like, again, well, you don't have to become more OCD because there's nothing you can do. Washing your hands a lot more because they're around, it's not protecting you. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe if they convince me, you know, there's a potential danger, like maybe wash your hands before you eat. But remember, the real danger from living with this person is they're breathing. You know, so how much am I gaining from washing my hands before I eat? You know, 
how how contaminated is the food and you know a zillion other questions where i could, could become ocd myself so you know part of it is uh that you know there's there's not much you can do and again you know wearing a mask 24 7 just in case i have it because if i don't have you know right it's not going to protect me from getting it so it's kind of like uh kind of like a mutually assured destruction. We're both going to wear a mask just in case one of us has it. But 24 seven, that's not going to work. And I, again, I don't know how that would work in an enclosed environment. Actually, I kind of do know how it would work in an enclosed environment because look at like New York, you know, old age homes where they're wearing insufficient masks around the clock and they're getting sick. I'm seeing a lot of questions about um, just uncertainty about when things are going to return to normal, including my own question. So how do how would you suggest talking to patients where their anxiety lies more in the return to normal and not knowing when that's going to happen, when kids are going to return to school, whether or not they're going to be laid off, just kind of the general uncertainty of life right now, as opposed to just getting or dying from COVID? Yeah. Um, so, you know, general uncertainty... You know, what I really like about talking about uncertainty, the answer is always the same. How will you try to cope with the worst if it happens? You know, like, it, will I lose my job? I mean, that's a really horrible, true question. And um, the closest you come to an answer is, well, what do you think you'll do? You know, what do you think will happen? Do you think you'll get thrown out in the street? Do you think you might be able to get some rent rebate? You know, hey, luckily eviction's really hard. You know, for real, right? I mean, you know, some of you, you know, it's hard to evict somebody when there's no COVID-19. I, I would be impressed to see somebody get evicted right now. But I mean, so those, those are all like, wow, that, that would suck horribly. I don't want to be in that situation. And I agree. Um, but, you know, I don't feel like being in the middle of a pandemic. Of course, I mean, me being in the middle of pandemic is way worse than the person we're just talking about who's losing their job. But, but you know, talking about it in a realistic way and, and trying to help the person, you know, I would always go to have it and think, what do you think you would try to do? Because I think the difference between denial and acceptance, denial is panic. This can't happen. No, I can't. No, it can't happen. And of course, you're in panic because everything you think, you know, it will happen or it can happen, to cope with it and say, like, that might happen, and here's what I'll have to do. And that's really depressing. It's not panic, but it is the beginning of acceptance, you know, because, you know, and this is a good time to remind people what acceptance means, because I think a lot of times people have this view of acceptance as like this kind of little Zen happy land, and everything's really wonderful, and acceptance actually sucks. Acceptance means something you don't want to live with. You're stuck in that, and that's the way it's going to be forever. So, yes, you might lose your job. How are we going to try to cope with that? In the very much the same way, if somebody's afraid of cancer, you might get cancer. In the very same way, somebody has cancer, and they're going to die in three years. How can we try to make those years better? The whole dying part is like, well, that, that's probably going to happen. I can't make that go away. All I can do is can we help you cope with it so you can enjoy what time you have left. So I think it doesn't matter if something is highly likely or highly unlikely. It's kind of the same answer for that. Um, so there, um, people are wondering about doing exposures via telehealth. Um, both, you know, non-COVID related exposures and potentially COVID related exposures. For example, you know, in the past, maybe some of us would have been um, very irreverent with- Maybe. <laughs> maybe yeah. would have been. Definitely. So, you know, getting into that toilet and the trash can, are those still, you know, exposure, are those exposures still on the table with COVID? And then what are some kind of non-COVID exposures um, that you've been doing uh, via telehealth right now? Well, you know, telehealth, as some people know, I, I'd been in Philadelphia until about five years ago where I'd practiced for a million years and I suddenly moved to California. 
Uh, so when I first moved, I was actually doing a good bit of telehealth, so I'm used to it now. Normally, which I've kind of relaxed a little bit, I would like had a few rules for anybody I would take on for telehealth in terms of how healthy they had to be. But telehealth, although it's definitely more preferable to be live, um, it works pretty well. And of course, it's great for home visits. So when I'm doing contamination, um, I can do a lot of stuff in the home. I treat the home the way I normally would have treated the entire environment. So I don't care what's in the home. I'm treating it as if it's um, all the normal risks are there as opposed to the risk of coronavirus. So, you know, toilets, tampons, trash, they're all open season, you know, so I'll take them, you know, let's, let's have them, you know, this, this one woman's terrified of getting her husband sick, you know, so we're, we're having her touch her vaginal area and then spreading it all over the dishes and every sheets and every other possible place. So in a sense, that looks exactly the same, except I'm not using, you know, sources from outside. They're, they're trash. Yeah, I'm treating their trash as like normal contaminated, so it will take the risk. Not that you won't get sick, you know, you might. Um, but look at the way your life is and the odds of the things that will definitely happen. And generally, the things that people are attempting to avoid, usually their rituals aren't sufficient enough to actually be avoiding them, you know. So that is, you know, no matter how much they're ritualizing, I can find flaws of why they're going to get sick anyway. So in-house exposure that's non-COVID is the same. What, what we're painfully not doing is I'm not having them going to, you know, trash cans outside. You know, I, I could probably obsess and make outside, you know, garbage cans if I live in a house uh, safe, but temporarily we're not doing that. Didn't you just remove the package that, you know, <laughs> that you're like, you know, the outside package and put that in the garbage. And didn't you just kind of put that wipe that you wiped, you know, your countertop with and your door handle with in your inside garbage? I mean, how do we, you know? Yeah, I treat that as if it were um, a contamination worth doing. Okay, okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the packaging, we're letting people throw away packaging and washing right now, you know, and again, I think in the long run, we won't find that risky. I think there's evidence to suggest it's safe enough, but this is currently deadly enough that um, we have to have a lot more evidence to find that it's low probability transmission. You know, I had no trouble with the idea of people getting the flu. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and my perception was people were getting the flu whether they were washing their hands. You know, people got the flu and it wasn't like, oh, you touch a toilet seat, you're getting the flu. You know, there was that flu pandemic, which they talk about that happened in the last 15 years. It's like, really, there was a pandemic? I didn't know there was a flu pandemic. Um, so until we know more about this or until we have a treatment that makes this inconsequential, you know, we had a treatment that knocks this down and people can be saved. All right, who cares? But um, right now it's, it's crossed my level of uncertainty. So then if you're doing that exposure, would you have somebody wash their hands before eating? This is a follow-up question. What, 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 what did they do and what, when, why are they washing their hands before eating? Well, because now they just did the exposure of going through the trash and touching the home toilet. Trash in their, no, trash in their house. We're going we're gonna to okay. have them not wash their hands. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, without washing their hands for 20 seconds after, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. And then how would you respond to uh, the people who bring up that Dr. Fauci says that he washes his hands 50 times a day? That's nice. Um, <laughs> I mean, health officials, you know, the one health official I was reading about who, you know, said he loves washing his hands. And I'm a health official. I think that's really important to keep, you know, for, for uh, hygiene. But he also said, I'm really not sure that this is a significant factor in, in COVID-19. He didn't say it isn't. But he, he's really not sure that it is. And, you know, that in the long run, we may find it's not. Um, you know, among the CDC's recommendations right now, when they say wash your hands a lot, they also say like wash your hands after going to the bathroom. All right. I know that has nothing to do with COVID-19. Right? They're just kind of, I mean, like I'm reading, it's like they didn't say if I go to the bathroom and don't wash my hands, I increase my risk of, you know, we're talking about your own bathroom at home. I'm not increasing the risk of getting COVID-19. So 
you have OCD, so right, we're gonna risk getting you sick in all the other ways. Now, it would suck if you get really sick and have to go to the hospital where your odds of getting COVID-19 go up. Um, we're gonna take that risk. Because there's a risk you'll just fall down and break your arm and have to go to the hospital. That might be equally high. And what about, you know, when you were talking about this um, imaginal exposure that may end with somebody may in fact die, uh, I'm sorry, like you, you're kind of- Get sick or die. Okay, and what if, it, what if the patient might say that they um, would kill themselves if some of these things were to happen? Well, I like to check. I mean, one thing that I always like to know is do they have children, you know, because it would be kind of bad if they killed their kid, you know, killed themselves, they have kids left behind. Um, I, I understand it, you know, I, I understand it would be really, you know, first of all, it depends who dies, you know, but again, if it's, I guess if it's just me and one other person and that person dies, it might be really tempting because uh, I have no one. Um, people say that even without COVID-19 that, you know, if this happens, I would kill myself. And generally part of treatment is, I want to hear how you would try to cope without killing yourself. Because, you know, in a way, just the thought that I'll kill myself is an avoidance. It's a way of not thinking about it. Um, and yeah, it might happen, you know. Are you feeling any better if you accidentally, you know, are carrying your kid fall down the stairs and that's how you accidentally kill your kid? Would you prefer that or COVID-19? And of course, they're both really horrible. You'd feel really guilty. And if you have two kids, are you going to kill yourself because one kid got killed? Um, we want, you know, th these are all things that can really happen. A lot of people obviously feel like they would kill themselves. I think I can get any parent and say, if your kids die, what are you going to do? And I think a lot of them would say, I'll kill myself. And just in a statistical way, we know that that's not true they're going to be really miserable. It's going to be horrible. But most of them won't do that. So I want the person to think through, how might you not do it? Again, how many people have I killed? You know, are you going to now, you know, like, wow, you know, your kids died, are you not going to abandon your spouse? Maybe. But um, so uh, it's not like an easy question, but it's a really real question, and, but it has nothing to do with COVID-19 in a way. Yes, you might accidentally be responsible, um, but presumably accidentally mean, being responsible means you didn't realize you had it. And the rituals you're engaging in are gonna protect the people around you. Again, if I'm worried about getting anyone sick, the only thing I can do is self-isolate and not be in the same house. So fine, okay. Go live somewhere else and don't be with your family. That doesn't seem to be a viable, uh, you know, thing to do. And you know, if you leave, you know, Anna, if you leave your home so that you don't get your kids sick, well, what about your husband? What if he gets them sick? You know, you should just let your two kids fend for themselves. You know, I, I pick kids because that's usually worse than losing a partner. But, you know, the worst thing about having children is. They survive only for one reason, luck. They don't usually, you know, get cancer and die. They don't usually get hit by a car. They don't usually get kidnapped. I have these, uh, this young woman I was working with, really horrible case of OCD, like she had been hospitalized for suicidal, you know, for being suicidal. She came in, she was a mess, her meds were a mess, and there were like three really dicey months till we got everything straightened out with her. And, uh, and then, like, it was around November, she started taking off amazingly and really improving incredibly. And, and it was, like, so cool for everybody to see her coming back. And um, she said we could be part of our support group. Uh, and initially, she was, like, 16. I was a little hesitant because it's uh, for adults. But her, she and her parents talked me into it. And in the support group, it was incredible. Whenever she spoke, she would think, say things so brilliant. Everybody would be amazed by her. 
you know, like, like they were shocked to find out she was so young. She didn't look old, but it's like, how could this be coming out of her mouth? That was around February of uh, more than a year, last, not this year, but last year, February, that, that you know, she was doing that. And uh, in June, I'm pretty sure it was June, uh, she, her brother, and her parents were driving from LA to Joshua Tree where they were purchasing a new home when a uh, drunk driver on her third DUI rammed the car and killed her and her brother. And um, leaving her parents, who, you know, I've been seeing for the last eight months, they let me talk about it. <sighs> Horrible things happen. You know, and coping with them is really hard and horrible. So how can I make sure that I don't hurt the people I love? And it's like, I can lower the odds, but I can't control them. And if I'm living in the house and my fear is giving them COVID-19, the fact I'm living in the house is like, if, if I have it, I can't protect them from the risk. Am I likely to give them COVID-19 because I touched something and touched them? That's, you know, I'm not saying we're gonna do that exposure on purpose, but it's not worth to be washing my hands every second once I've, after I do that initial hand wash. I think that kind of answers it in a really horrible, truthful way. You know, I think, again, acceptance is terrible. The thing a parent has to accept is, I can't protect my kids. I don't have the option of saying they will never die, you know, and I can mess any parent up. I said, think about your kid dying. But if you have two kids, as horrible as it'd be to lose one, are you now going to abandon the other? As much as it seems like I could never be happy again, what do you want to teach the other kid about that? So how would you try to cope even with the worst? It doesn't mean we'll be successful at it, but we've seen people who are successful. So the best I can hope is I would be one of the successful people. You can't do what you won't imagine. Now the, I don't mean the reverse is true in some really Pollyanna way. You can do anything you imagine, that's not true. But if you won't even imagine it, you can't do it. So when I talk about coping with the death of a child or the death of someone, most people go like, yep, not thinking about that. So we would think about that because as COVID-19 has shown us, anything really can happen. Kind of related um, in terms of like hand washing a lot to protect your kids. Um, I'm seeing in the chat and I've also experienced this with some of my patients checking children's significant other's temperature, checking their respiration. Um, you mentioned limiting the news 15 minutes a day um, just to kind of decrease, you know, checking the CDC, the death count, all of that. Can you speak a little bit more about what you would recommend? Well, certainly limiting the news just because, again, on a daily basis, the CDC doesn't, all, you know, come up with some new amazing thing. It's like, stop, do this. It's pretty much the same every day. So there's not a reason to be checking it that constantly. Um, and again, because on the news, we will hear all kinds of things, you know, and some of them are go way beyond the CDC. And in a logical way, so, you know, they sound logical. Mm -hmm but I have to rely on something. So it's not like I think the CDC is God. It's just like, that's the closest thing I have to trust. So I, I really, really want to stress them, you know, to not listen to the other stuff because, you know, it could all sound logical, but this is what we're following blindly. Even if we find out tomorrow, they change. Um, checking temperatures and respiration, we tell them don't. You know, I mean, yes, for, for my hypochondriacal patients, they're, they're really, you know, terrified. You know, it's like, first of all, you know, first of all, the good news, if you're not terribly symptomatic now, you might be one of the lucky ones. You know, like if you actually have it and you're in like, have to find, you know, take your temperature to figure out if you have it, um, that's a waste of time. And 
in the situation where no one's complaining, we're not getting an early intervention by taking temperature or checking oxygen levels in the blood. You know, I kind of, they bought that device from Amazon. Probably can't get it anymore. But if they bought that device from Amazon, it's like, yeah, chuck it. Um, because it's, you know, if it's that subtle, even though you hear the stories, this person's walking around, I don't know how they were walking around. Um, but yes, you're going to have to be more sick to get it. Because let's say, so if I check my kid, my kid has a temperature of 100, I can't do anything. No one's going to test that kid. No one's going to do anything for that kid. They're not going to give them the preventative drug because it doesn't exist. So me, me having an elevated temperature tells me nothing. Well, I guess the uh, question is, if you do have the device and if you do have the higher fever, um, then perhaps you can- I have The what? I didn't hear the second thing you said. Oh, just that if you, um, if you, you know, have this device and are, perhaps you will seek out medical attention sooner, right? That, that's the idea. Um, and we'll be able to get um, uh, help earlier and increase your likelihood of um, survival. You have the device, don't you, Anna? I don't have the device, but I'm- really Oh, good, good. I'm sorry. You have that face and it's like, oh, she's got this. This is a personal question. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, no, but when you're, I but saw you're, but that you're not, article, but I was like, oh no, my patients but, got that device now. But I, I mean, I understand that maybe if you do not have OCD, how that could be um, a reason, you know, that how it might be more reasonable to get the, this device. No, have OCD. because ahead. if you're not sick enough, you're not going in. Okay. Jennifer, in other words, I'm, no, I'm going to have, you know, what? like we're talking about a subgroup of people who are really pretty sick and then they have the device and it's showing up. If I'm like pretty asymptomatic, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm gonna show this oxygen debt in my, my blood, that, that's kind of currently a low probability event. You know, so for the most part, if you're gonna need medical attention, you're gonna be sick enough. Uh, what about somebody who's higher risk though? Somebody with underlying pulmonary issues that breathing or COPD, that breathing was an issue to begin with. But would you still to, be? But, yeah, because unless unless they actually, you know, I would want their doctor to tell them two things. I want you to do this test, and if the number shows this, come in. I don't think, you know, now some doctors might do it because what the hell, you might as well do that. But for the most part, if I'm not actually sicker, nobody's going to do anything for me. I think there are physicians that are recommending that people who are more at risk have it just in case they develop symptoms as some sort of a threshold for whether or not they go to the emergency room? Mm -hmm. Some doctors are doing that, but, but they'd have to have the symptoms also. Right, right. And, and if we have somebody who's hypochondriacal, whether or not they're at risk, because I can be hypochondriacal and you know, be at greater risk and sick, I could have COPD and hypochondriasis, you know, we'd have to define what those more symptoms look like. I have a client who's not at risk and he keeps feeling like he's coughing and having trouble breathing. Um, and it's like, well, it's going to have to be clearer than, you know, it's going to have to go beyond the level of a panic attack. And, and so we're going to have to see something a lot more enduring and a lot more, a lot worse. Because at this point, nobody would take him in. And at this point, probably if he had an oxygen problem, nobody's taking him in. So we're going to think like, what? What, what information do I actually get? I don't get any information from taking my temperature every day. You know, if I suddenly wake up tomorrow, my temperature is 102, and I didn't realize it's 102, um, nobody's going to do anything for me. And if it's 102, nobody's going to do anything for me. Nobody's going to say, come in because your temperature is 102. They're going to ask me a bunch of other questions, and they will also have to be true. Uh, so... The, um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking, you know, so, so we're going to have to. Yeah, we're getting a lot of chatter on this. I'm trying to I keep think, up too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I said, I, I'm seeing the chatter on the side. Um, so we're going to have to wait for things to get worse, basically. You know, as opposed, to, because again, it, it's not even like, it's not even like the good old days when you know, you'd be panicking, think you're sick, you're not sick, but you could rush to the emergency room anyway. 
Uh, right now, first of all, that might be stupid because you're more likely to get sick. And um, again, think about like, what is somebody going to actually do for me at this point in time? Um, you know, what percentage of those pneumonia cases exist that would have been caught this way? Uh, well, and somebody had written, and I think you just answer this, the rationale to explain to not do the checking is you and somebody else wrote in the chat are like, you'd probably know if you're having trouble breathing or a high fever. Yeah, right. You know, taking my temperature when I think I have a high fever. Okay, you know, but I mean, that's kind of like a normal thing, but just like as a daily check on my children, uh, you'll know if your kid's sick probably. Is there potential on an outlier, not at a great enough, not, not great enough to take extra measures? You know, if we had a nice, horrible, silent killer where the only measure was this internal measure and otherwise people are dropping dead left and right, that would be a different situation, but we're not there on this one. Are there, are there any, I think a lot of people are asking for more like, like some examples on clinical interventions, like actual things that you might say to patients who are looking for reassurance, trying to understand why you wouldn't engage in these checking behaviors. And, um, and just as an aside, Lindsay, everything I've said here, I say to patients. Great. So, so, so in, in one hand, it's like, I, 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 I you know, I, it's, it's funny. I, I did a, uh, a talk on the, uh, the thing called the OCD stories, uh, which is a great site on this subject. And that was for sufferers. And um, I think it was very much a duplicate of what we're saying here. Um, it changes some of the contamination exposures. Um, almost nothing else does it change. You know, the what if I get my family sick? Um, that might happen. Um, you know, if, if somebody was simultaneously a healthcare worker and they had OCD, how do they and their family want to handle it? You know, that's a hard question that I don't know. Like I could, I could buy either answer, but you know, and I'd want to really, you know, somebody who's working in a COVID-19 unit, you know, I said, I know the one couple where the, uh, the one woman was working on a unit, like they weren't, you know, well, they live in a New York Manhattan apartment, right? In a Brooklyn apartment. So it's like, there's no way to self-isolate. She had no place to go. So they were just at risk. When she came home, there was nothing to do. So they were at risk. And the one partner does have a whole set of other problems that would put her at greater risk. But um, so certain things just aren't feasible and they're scary. I have, a, if, if somebody has um, kind of a propensity toward OCD and, and, and is generally more anxious and lives in New York, but was able to quarantine and get out of New York, do you have any recommendations in terms of like, would you, can, would you tell them stay out as long as possible so as you don't trigger your OCD when you come back? Or do we want to say like, get back as soon as possible so we can work on just living with this? So I'm pausing so you know that it's not like an obvious answer. Um, I wouldn't care. I, would, I wouldn't push it either way. Um, because, you know, unfortunately, although some greater odds in New York, clear, not even, you know, apparently seemingly definitely greater odds, um, it's not like you're actually safe somewhere else. So, you know, it's not like, I, I don't know where anybody would be moving and it's like, I can take no precautions. Um, so I, I would, I would leave it either way. Okay. I have somebody who, who's asking you to repeat the argument to why we patients should follow the CDC guidance. Um, versus what their friend, family member, who is a top medical, you know, director or doctor um, who thinks differently should do. What is the exact question? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, why choose the CDC guideline versus something else? Oh, <laughs> or is like um, a personal info. In it, 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 it's the closest we have to a kind of curated view of scientific knowledge currently. 
I can always find, I can, I said, I, I can find some, and first of all, if I'm just looking at, you know, quote unquote health experts, I can find a really wide range of stuff. Uh, but if we look, let's say, you know, high level scientists, you know, and, and people who are major researchers, I can still find some differences. And so I'm like going with the average, you know, and, and why not just take the most cautious because there's like not really an upper limit to the most cautious. You know, it, it's, a, it's a calculated risk as everything is, you know, I go in dumpsters, you know, prior to this, that's supposed to not be a good thing. I miss doing um, ABC gum. Go on. Well, um, I, I was just trying to read through the comments too. And I think, um, you know, uh, everybody might find this um, helpful. You're struck by lightning story that some people don't know. Actually, it might be worse than you realize uh, because I was struck by lightning. My wife, Kathy, was struck by lightning on separate occasions. I was uh, doing one of my camping trips. We were uh, climbing a mountain in a thunderstorm because we were, you know, I had made sure we were stranded on this so there was no way to go but up. And we hit the top and everybody's really happy. And I have to point out, like, we're at the top of a mountain in a thunderstorm. This is like the worst place to be. And at that critical moment, uh, this tree five of us were leaning against got hit by lightning really loud. I really actually never heard anything that loud. And it ran through us. If you ever put your hand in a socket, it was kind of like that, you know, and um, people started scattering in every direction. And I had to basically scream, stop, you get lost, I'm not coming for you. Um, they realized there was no place to go. And so we quickly got off the mountain. Somebody wanted to know, should we check with a hospital? I thought, well, we've already been defibrillated, so what's the point? Um, on a separate occasion, my wife was sitting in my son's bedroom by an open window, and she and he were sitting on the bed when ball lightning, it's lightning that looks like a ball, came through the window, went through her arm and into the computer surge protector. Amazingly did not blow up the computer honestly, dead seriously, all electronics clocks in the house were blinking 12. We have no idea whether the surge protector saved her or pulled the lightning in in the first place. Um, my son, it made him a little worried because it seemed like if there's a attract lightning gene, he's got the double dose. It was like, what are the odds of us being hit by lightning on separate occasions? Um, anything can happen. Um, we're following just the CDC as a kind of, that's our version of exposure. And I, I can tell by all the questions people change. Uh, and, and I see people disagree with me, which I don't know how that's actually possible. But um, I'm just reading a question. Somebody's asking, would I do a coughing exposure in public for people who are afraid of getting others sick? And the reason I wouldn't do the coughing exposure right now is the same reason I wouldn't do the screen fire in a movie theater exposure. Um, you know, I think it's a great exposure, but I think there's some additional problems with it. Uh, so Kathy and I have, am I quiet? Am I muted? Sorry, I think the person said imaginal exposure. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Um, I think the imaginal exposure that maybe I'm gonna get people sick if I was coughing, I don't really feel like pretending that I, I don't think that would, I, I, it doesn't strike me as, as uh, potent. I, I, you know, I might have them imagine that um, if I'm worried about getting, I mean, again, if, are they worried about getting people sick? Are they worried about people looking at them strangely and thinking like, oh my God, you're a danger. Um, 
if they're worried about people looking at the danger, then I could do imaginal exposure. If they're worried about getting people sick, I would just kind of switch to breathing. I um, think it was in the context of other people looking at them as a threat or yeah. like an embarrassment sort of an exposure. Well, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think I would have them wear, I, you know, I wouldn't mind actually having them wear a mask and walking around in public and doing some coughing. I, I would be okay with that. I mean, I would want them to keep their distance and everything, just on the off chance they actually have it. But I could see that. Kathy and I have sometimes considered that, like that person can walk in. I don't think they're going to move out of our way. Maybe we should start coughing. You know, kind of seemed like a fun thing to do. Uh, we haven't done that, but yeah, I, th I think that circumstance of coughing I would do, so that uh, you know. And then again, you know, if I hear somebody cough, you know. Well, I don't look at them like they're horrible. I just look scared, you know. You know, did you have to cough near me? Um, yeah, I could say that though, if I'm keeping my distance and everything, you know, cough 10 feet away, why not? I would want to do it closer just on the off chance they actually have it and until we know more. Again, it's, it's partially like I'm waiting for us to know more to, to get this down to like the normal level of uh, like it might happen, but probably won't. John, I um, I was just going to, we just allowed some of the uh, attendees who had different viewpoints to have the option to speak uh, directly to you. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna give that uh, Jennifer a chance to do that. Jennifer? Uh, Jennifer Lish? Uh, yeah, I, I disagree. Um, I think, uh, some of your advice uh, is not the advice that I am giving to patients recently. I think the world changed. Um, I, I would not have somebody cough in public. I would be concerned that they would be assaulted or uh, even seriously injured. Uh, I would I would not advise someone against purchasing an O2 set a pulse oximeter these days. I would not advise someone uh, against testing checking uh, checking temperatures. Um, the, the I've blown up the chat with basically I revere you and I used to practice exactly as you practiced, including uh, making love to toilets. Um, and eating wet food after touching every surface in my office building. I would, not, I would not do any of that currently. I'm not meeting with anybody face to face. And um, a lot of the things that you're saying you would tell people are uh, manifestations of a psychiatric illness, I would say currently are not manifestations of, of psychiatric illness. I think the world changed, circumstances changed. Well, I definitely believe that I'm not God. So <clears throat> I think nothing bad will happen to you from disagreeing with me. Um, some of the things you said you were disagreeing with me or you actually agree with me because I'm not seeing anyone live. I am so disappointed. I am not doing any exposures outside. So. All, all the things that I would normally be doing, where like, let's walk in the street and touch things. We're just not doing those things. I could make a case as to why I think it's probably okay, but I would agree the world has changed at this point in time. And so uh, this is bad enough that for the time being, there are a lot of modifications that I've been making in what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, so the things I'm, you know, some of the areas where you're disagreeing with me, um, yes, you do disagree with me, you know. Um, uh, I, I'm not, you know, and again, part of my reason for, let's say, not getting the O2 is um, the number of people who would be saved by that is a, is a small number, you know, if we look at the total number and it, it's, you know, more often 
that's in conjunction with having a lot of other symptoms. Uh, I, yeah, I have read that um, there. I, I want to raise my hand and disagree with that. Um, as you know, the information is changing rapidly, and that's yeah. why I tread very carefully when I give advice to patients today or agree or disagree with anything patients are doing. And so there is evidence that people can have uh, reduced oxygen in their blood, re reduced O2 set, uh, with no symptoms, no, no re respiratory distress, kind of an occult pneumonia before they become more critically ill. And I believe that if I contacted my 72-year-old partner's uh, physician, uh, and reported that his uh, that my partner's O2 sat had gone down. I would be told about how to position him. They're, they call it proning. I believe I would be told since I don't have a ventilator at home. I believe I would be told to keep him uh, prone rather than supine. And that could change tomorrow. There could be additional advice that I would be told tomorrow. So I would certainly change for tomorrow. And, and one of the things I did say is. If a physician specifically told me or a client of mine, this device is good for you given your situation, I would not argue with it. I was just against the everybody buying it just in case. Uh, physician telling me and a physician telling me, buy this and here's what I want you to do if this happens, fine, of course. Uh, I'm not going to go against the physician. And so if new medical advice comes up and the physician's giving me something concrete, uh, yes, um, you might be more conservative than I. So that would just be a difference where we wouldn't agree. Um, okay. Um, so what about... Um, how would you work with somebody who is um, repeatedly checking their breathing, their own breathing, and is hyper focused on yeah. their breathing? You know, in a way that then becomes really no different than any time somebody has right health anxiety. Um, checking my breathing, you know every 20 minutes, every hour, isn't really going to be instructive, right? Like we need for it to be not possibly sick, but I would like to have, I would, I would like the person to feel sicker in a much clearer way and see it get worse. I mean, right, in OCD in general, right? You know, when somebody's worried about a physical problem, it's, and they often will have, you know, a variety of symptoms, like what am I sick with this week? And, and again, you know, with OCD and hypochondriasis, um, you know, many people with hypochondriasis are also sick, you know, it's not like they, you know, the trouble is the way they're worried about the illness. And so, you know, they may have gone to doctors multiple times and basically it's like, okay, you're sick. We don't know what it is. It doesn't seem to be dangerous because you're not dying and we're all keeping our fingers crossed. So going to a doctor again, is not going to yield anything new, you know, going, so it's like, you know, checking your blood pressure 30 times a day is not going to tell you anything. So in the same way, that, that person you're going to want to interfere with checking their breathing, that would be a rough one because you can do it. So, you know, they say you take your blood pressure, you have to do something. Uh, I would do, you know, some imaginal exposure. Um, and we would go through like, you know, again, if I check my breathing, you know, the question is, at what point would I be able to go in? Um, so I'm going to need for the symptoms to get worse if that's, you know, if they have a health concern, you know, now in the, in the off chance we hit the individual who doesn't have the O2 meter is actually at risk or their doctor didn't tell them to buy one and they're, you know, hypochondriacal and they have the problem that, that would be, that would be that off chance that would be taking the risk of happening. Um, I'm sorry. Go on. What would you do um, with a patient who might not feel particularly motivated right now to do ERP? Would you be okay with taking a break? Would you really try to boost their motivation, or is it kind of up to them? How would you how would you deal with that? 
I'm smiling as you partially asked when you said, would it be up to them? Um, you know, cause, cause I've often said that, you know, patients say you're going to make me do something and it's like, I'd be happy to make you do something if I thought that would work. You know, like, fine, we'll just tie you down and treat you. But it turns out I doesn't really work. So I think of myself much more as a professional nag. Um, I would always, so, and, and I think the, the mistake therapists make across the board, this or not, with exposure, is that I, I always tell clients, don't do anything I tell you to do unless I've convinced you. I don't want you just following orders. And so um, I'd rather argue with them. And so I think that is always the issue, you know, and maybe the area I'm clever is I come up with good arguments, you know. I'm, really a persistent nag, so I probably break people down over time with that. So, and again, I, in terms of not motivated, I would, I would be talking about, well, what, you know, what might happen as a result of that, you know, you know, because um, this is obviously a stress, all problems get worse under stress, and um, to not work on it ultimately could be kind of a sign of depression also because you know it just doesn't feel worth it and so there's that worry that they're going to be much worse so you know how can I help them cling to something so that um you know and make the best of this current terrible life I mean for someone you know I mean for so many of my clients you know they were you know some people who were just getting back into life it's like 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 now they're isolated and it's like uh, you know, and they want to know what to do, you know, and trying to get people to structure their life and do things that are interesting. I mean, that's a major problem. You know, like having a schedule when you don't need to have a schedule seems so incredibly stupid. Um, but we point out that like, you know, it is artificial, but it turns out, you know, like, like people in solitary confinement and everything, like the way you stay sane is you have these schedules that are artificial. You know, yep, you get dressed, you do things, you know, it'd be kind of cool if you got up and, you know, and, and, you know, and can we find something that you find interesting to do? You know, so some people actually have stuff that's interesting. Other people, it's like, I'm not really interested in anything. In which case, we're kind of stuck the way we always are, just like way, way harder, you know, because if I have somebody who can't tell me what they enjoy doing, and I'm talking about separate from this, it's like, <clears throat> it's not like I, have this incredible chest of things where I know all the interesting things or that might do it. It's like, okay, if you're not interested in anything, we're going to have to try things and have you stay at them a little bit to see if you like them. You know, it's like random. You won't, you won't think you like them. Maybe you will. So I, I would have to be doing that at home. And that's, that's still right. That, that's uh, not easy. Right. It's not like it's a magic bullet, but um, you know, Again, okay, you've, you know, I'm sure you have found personally, you know, suddenly you're having FaceTime or Zoom sessions with people you didn't talk to as much in the past. So like in a way you're almost more social, um, right? It's kind of weird, you know? So, so how can I get people to connect and do things and, and try to find something and try to set them on some schedule, right? Because that's, this is like, it's a COVID-19 problem for everyone, not just our clients. I was hearing in Irish comedian who's out of work who got a little time on NPR basically talking about, you know, her big part of her day was, you know, what kind of toast was her dad going to bring her? And she was, she was kind of jealous of the people who had something to do because there's like literally nothing she can do. She has to figure out how to occupy herself at home with her parents. Um, so, so that's a very real problem of how are people going to structure and saying the lack of motivation, um, yes, you're not motivated, there's a cost for that. And um, so can I, can I paint, you know, how far do you want to go back? And of course, not being motivated, does that mean you're sinking worse into it? Because let's face it, if I'm stuck at home with nothing to do, and I'm descending into OCD, that actually sounds pretty scary, you know? Well, it's not like do this horrible treatment or hey, just relax and have fun. If you can really relax and have fun, I might say, well, sure, stop treatment. You know, I always think the major goal of treatment is making life more fun. So yeah, if you could pull that off, but we don't really think they would. So I, I would try to be having these discussions with them of, 
you know, what might happen if they don't do that? You know, if, if just be, you know, as everybody here has had, you know, you have somebody with OCD, often if there's some like stressor, the OCD gets worse. And, and what I'm always saying to them is, you know, and, and people have kind of a um, leaky roof syndrome. You know, I don't want to work on a problem in the middle of it because it's just too hard. And when it's really a good day, I don't want to work on it because why bring that up? Uh, if another problem is present, I want them to work on OCD because that problem is bad enough. We don't need to have two major problems. And uh, the pandemic, you know, the only good thing about the pandemic is everybody will understand. Right. And it's like, yeah, yeah, this is this is terrible. This is weird. You know, um, you know, somebody asked earlier talking about like, what about the end of this? And what do we tell people? Well, the truth is really pretty horrible and scary. You know, like, I don't know how long social isolation is viable, but until there's a, until there's an actual treatment, so it's not so scary, although that's still not quite a time to end it, or until there's a vaccine, this is probably going to go on in waves at best. You know, so maybe it'll be some normalcy, but it's not going to be normal. Things are going to be hard for everybody. And, you know, so the idea like it's, you know, and, and I think people are gradually getting that, you know, and people don't want to hear it. It's like, but I can't live like that. And that's that denial. It's like, it's not like any of us have a choice. So I, I like gently saying the truth. It sounds harsher when I say it here, but, but right. It's the truth. Like this is the way it's going to be for all of us. So, so how are we going to try to make the best of this? I was uh, taking a walk with my wife the other day, or you know, our pandemic walk, and she, Kathy said something like, uh, "Well, it's like a really pretty day. It's too bad all this is happening." Now, since all of you are psychologists, you understand that being married to a psychologist is not always the best thing. You know, and I said, "No, honey, no, no, honey, you have it all wrong." I said, "You're mixing these two events together. It is a beautiful day." you and I were walking out together and that's great. And it simultaneously sucks that this is going on. They're separate. Now, <clears throat> again, if we're talking mindfulness, not the really super Zen, it's a beautiful day. We're together. So nothing else exists. So fuck all that other stuff. Um, Cause I don't think that's realistic. It's like, we're going to have both those emotions. Let's not conflate them. This is really great. I like being with you. It is really pretty today. And yet all this stuff sucks at the same time. We're in a more horrible example. The couple I told you about where both kids were killed in a car crash. It's almost a year later. And uh, they were in Joshua Tree, which is, you know, kind of this nice national park where they have a home. The home they were going to buy the day the kids died. And they were out at night looking at, uh, there was a meteor shower. And, uh, and then dad had been saying something like he was really looking forward to like, you know, kind of going out and resting and like enjoying the meteor shower. And they said, uh, they were watching the meteor shower and they were all, they were crying. Cause you know, they were thinking of the kids. And we said the same thing. It was a beautiful meteor shower and it was horribly sad. And and because we have a kind of gentle, joking relationship and that's the idea you're gonna go out there and just rest and be a complete peace. Yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. That's not a thing that's happening now. And, and you know, he kind of laughed because it's like, right, that's not happening. So it was both at the same time. That's reality and the fantasy is so much better. That's why we like denial because fantasy is always better than reality. But it's always disappointing because it's not true. It's not like they wish they hadn't seen the meteor shower, but they were also crying. That's where we're all living right now actually right for me way better than that but right we're living a lesser version of that 
Thank you, John. This has um, been really terrific. And I, I think just what you were, I was thinking just about what you were speaking to right now, that what we're really talking, have been talking about here is how do we do our best, yeah, given this really challenging, trying, traumatic for many time, um, how do we still do this work that's important that is, you know, because the other side of not doing it, right, there's such a cost to not doing it. And we've seen what our patients go through um, when the rituals are out of control. And, um, and so there's always kind of this balance, right? And um, so thank you for giving us some guidance. Um, and um, thank you to everybody for tuning in today. And we will have uh, this webinar available um, online. Uh, check out our website at NYCCBT. As soon as we're able to, we will have the webinar available. Thank you. I said, I hope this was helpful. Um, you know, I feel like I don't have amazing truths to share. So it makes me a little insecure, you know like oh this is how we're all stuck but but you know it is you know i find with all my clients right now i don't know that we ever not talk about covid19 there's some satisfaction in being able to help people cope with it you know that they feel more comfortable yeah yeah and really being in it with them yeah thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. Everybody stay well. Take care all. Bye everyone. Thank you.